awful quiet in here, didn't it? <laughs> All righty. So glad you're here today. Are you glad to be here today? Yes. yes. It's good to know the Lord, isn't it? Yes. One of the great things about knowing the Lord is we have hope, don't we? Yes. If you're out there in the world today and you don't know them, it's a pretty hopeless situation. The difference between us and them is we have hope. We have the same problems, the same issues, things going, we're, same things we're struggling with, but we know we have the answer and the antidote. One day it's going to be all over and we're going to be in heaven and we're going to be shouting and hooping and hollering. And we don't have to worry about counting carbohydrates and mosquitoes and <laughs> Democrats and Republicans and all that craziness. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand up today and let's, uh, let's rejoice in the Lord with some hope today. Amen? Amen. Brother Dan, why don't you come on up here now? Dan the man. Those of you who haven't met Dan yet, Dan, Dan is gone through the program, came from Duncan, full servant, now on staff. I like this guy. <laughs> I love him, but I like him too. <laughs> you know, you can love people and not like them. <laughs> but I love this guy, I like him too, you know? <laughs> this is a guy that runs to the light. Amen. He runs to the truth. He, he's willing to take the hits and the pain of what it means to live in the truth, and he's not afraid. He runs to the light, not from the light. So we're going to be talking about it here a little. So I got Dan up here today because uh, this is the kind of guy. This is what we're all about here. When you got a drug addiction or alcohol problem or whatever, you know, we're all about trying to be well, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We all can do be better. Anyway, I'm gonna have you pray with the offering. We'll pass the baskets and uh, Damien. Is it, you heard the status on him? Um, we'll get him checked in. So yeah, Damien um, is actually at the hospital. He was checked in, so we can keep him lifted up, just ill. So, um, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to come together as one body and here to worship you, Lord, and, and to hear your truth spoken. Lord, I ask that you put your healing hand on Damien and on every person that's sick, every family member that's sick or lost in addiction, Lord. Just guide them to you and let them find peace and comfort in you. Lord, I ask that you be over this offering uh, and let it be used to your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, amen. That verse comes out of 2 Timothy 1, 12. Paul is not too far from his departure. He's about to go to the big show up in heaven. He says his life has been poured out as an offering. Uh, he said it's not long before I'm about to go home. And he says, I know. I'm not confused. I'm not uncertain. I'm not doubting my salvation. He says, because I know I'm fully persuaded, positively persuaded, confident, without a doubt, whom I have believed in. Amen. I'm convinced, no doubt about it, that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What is that day? That day is graduation <coughs> day. We're all going to be going there someday. Paul's thinking about heaven and he says man I know I'm confident not because because I know who, who the person is that I believe in but I've entrusted to him and he's convinced that he's able to guard it protect it until that day I mean you get a little afraid out there today uh, it's a pretty nervous time to be alive isn't it out there even knowing the Lord sometimes my human frailties catch up with me <laughs> But I know whom I've believed in, okay? I finally come to the conclusion it wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol, it wasn't sex. It, uh, I finally came to the point that uh, the only person I need to be believing in is Jesus Christ. 
I'm letting all my money ride on King Jesus. Are you with me? Amen. He's either going to come in, I'm going to be a winner, or I'm going to be a loser. So either way, I made a decision. The only thing that works for me, and I've been trusting my whole life to him. Are you with me? Yeah. Everything. <coughs> Finally. Uh, and I'm trusting in that today. Let me ask you today, who are you? Who are you trusting in? Jesus. Who have you believed in? Who are you depending on? What is your hope today? Amen? Amen. Turn me to John 18.35. John 18.35. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, my, acceptable in thy sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. One of the things I always start off is what is the Spirit saying? Doesn't matter what the media is saying, doesn't matter what I say, really. The only thing that really matters is what God says. And God is speaking to us. What is that spirit, God? Uh, uh, Revelation says that uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Yep. Yes. Okay? okay. You need to, are you, how many is part of the church in here? We'll talk about this next week, about the true remnant. The church is not a building. Church isn't just everybody in here today. Church is a remnant, a, a group of believers that are serious. Okay? And, and God is speaking. And we need to pay attention and not refuse him who is speaking. Okay, so he's speaking to us, and he's speaking from our heart. He's speaking to our world. He's speaking to our country. He's speaking to us as a church here and, and individually. So what's, what's really going on? What is the word? As disciples, we have to learn to really ask that question. What's really going on? Okay. Now, uh, especially nowadays. We have two dynamics. We have a natural dynamic where we got a world of sin and we got problems and issues. We have to be concerned. That's real. We have to deal with that. But in light of that, what is really going on in a supernatural realm? There's always two dynamics. Right now, I'm dying too. We're all dying. Okay, that's reality, boy. I toss and turn all night out with arthritis and all kinds of things. But like I told Rob, my inner man is being prepared, being prepared for my real home in heaven. I'll be there forever and forever and forever. Amen. Okay? So what's really, really going on is, hey, I'm just kind of down here doing time. Okay? I'm just hanging out. I'm just, I know whom I believe in. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed. I got to get up and take care of my body. I got to pay bill. I got to do all these things. And, you know, but the way I get through it is I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. The bigger dynamic is that who knows when the trumpet's going to sound for me. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I could be gone from here. I could beat you, Rob, and beat everybody. You never know. Uh, but what's really going on is, man, I've got a home in heaven. I'm going to be there forever. And we got to start learning to live in light of eternity. Amen? Amen. Verse 35, John 18, Pilate, uh, Jesus has been arrested. Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. And he said, what have you done? What have you, I talked about this a lot, of what have you done? You know, Pilate's recognizing this guy, you know, I mean, he's, he's a good guy, what's going on? What, what, what is it you're being, what have you done? And I can just picture Jesus saying, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> you know. But Jesus is looking at what's really going on. He's realizing that Pilate has no real interest in what he has to say. So he probably could go into this big rant and this drama of who he is and paint this picture. But he's probably realizing you have no idea. You're not interested. So what's the point? I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my energy. Jesus answered, and says, well, my kingdom, what's really going on, is my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is a different world. My, king, my kingdom is, is, 
You have no idea. Okay? It's not in this realm. He said, if my kingdom were right here, right now, my servants would be here uh, like ants and deliver me from the situation. But because there's a bigger dynamic going on, what's going on here is it's okay because I, I've, I know whom I believe in. I know what's going on. I know what's really happening. I'm prepared for it. I got to do it. But there's a so much bigger picture. So for now, do what you got to do. You know, uh, he said, my kingdom, they would be fighting for me. Then, therefore, Pilate responded back to him, So you're a king. And Jesus said, You say correctly that I am a king, for I have been for this I have been born. This is my purpose. For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Amen. Everyone who is of the truth hears what I'm saying. Today, if you have ears to hear, let yourself hear what the Spirit of God is telling you. He's speaking. If you're on the Lord and you know the Lord, the Lord is speaking to you. You don't have to try to figure out what would Jesus do and you know just turn in there and ask him. It's right there. And then Pilate said back to him, What is truth? Now I said this last week. Was what attitude was that? Was it one of mockery? Sarcasm? I'm like, what is truth? Who are you? Who do you think you are? I'm Pilate. I mean, it could have been a real mockery or, uh, of someone who uh, doesn't want the truth, not interested in the truth, could care less, would rather live in the lie and be his own God. Or he could have been asking a, a serious question. No, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've heard things about you, you know, and what they say, and I really want to know the truth. Come on, let's, you know, let's talk. Or, I mean, so it could be coming out of a sarcasm, which is typical of our world today, isn't it? Oh, what is truth? Who cares? Who cares if you're the same sex and you're getting married? Who cares about this? Who cares about that? And what is true? That, isn't that the world we live in? Nobody cares about truth anymore. Not really. They call good evil, evil good. People don't even know what truth is. You know? But then there's some people that, that want to get well. They want to grow. They want to, they want to get healed. They, they, run, they run to the truth. They run to the light because they want to get better. And so today we have that spirit of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians refers to a spirit of lawlessness which comes from the Antichrist. It's always been. And it's been working. Since the days of Jesus, it's been working. You know, till now, and it's going to continue to work. And that spirit of lawlessness is, is an attitude or a spirit that is trying to undermine God's truth. That, that's its sole objective. That's the Antichrist spirit. So, you really want to know what's really going on today? What's really going on is we got a world uh, that is under the devil's influence. This is the, the world, you know, the cosmos here. This world is of the devil, it's his world. And he is out to undermine and to uh, to uh, infiltrate the church and with a deluding influence so that people don't know what is true. And it's working, isn't it? It's been restrained, but pretty soon that restraining hand of God is going to come out and He's going to say, sick him, and He's going to turn loose the Antichrist. Then you're going to see a serious thing going on of confu mass confusion. And that's what we're seeing right now. People don't know what is, what is true. Preachers aren't preaching the truth, letting us know. Schools certainly aren't telling us what's true. Kids, uh, parents aren't telling us what is true. So how do I know what is true? You got it right here. Amen. Right here. Between this and the spirit that lives inside of me, who's my helper, my comforter, who tells me everything I need to know, this is the final authority. Okay. okay. Listen, did you hear what I said? This is God's word, God breathed, God inspired. It's been given by instruction. It's been sanctified. It's been blessed. It's been given to us as our rule book. So if we want to know what is truth, you got to come back around here, and you better get a love for the truth. Okay, Thessalonians says right there that that there will be a deluding influence where people will be turned over because they did not develop a love for the truth. They'll be deceived. 
And is that not what we're seeing going on right now? Yeah. We need to develop a love for the truth. Turn with me this morning. John 3.16. Anybody heard that one before? Yeah. Today my sermon is going to be practicing the truth. Practice is what our habit is. It's how we choose to live our life. Discipline. How we discipline our life. The moral indictment. It's basically talking about uh, those who run to the truth, who want the truth, who want to get well. Those that run away from the truth, run away from the light. That are under a judgment. I don't know about you, but I've been down here hanging out too long to miss it now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, does anybody here really want to get healthy today, okay? If you're not serious and you know you don't want to hear truth and this ain't the place to be, you just sit back there, that's all right, you know, I mean, whatever. God is calling me to be a preacher of righteousness. In these last days, to stand up for what I believe is the truth. It may be wrong or might, be, might not be, but I want to do my best to, to be one who hears God's truth, preaches God's truth, listens to God's truth, preach the whole truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so nothing God. Cover to cover, page to page, preach the word of God in season and out of season. Whether it's welcome or unwelcome, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether people like it or they don't like it. Whatever my job is to preach it, let it fly, and then make adjustments and changes. Okay. I don't fear man who can take my body and throw me in jail, which might be coming to those times. But the Bible tells me I need to be more fearful of, of God who can throw my body into hell and everything. Are you, you understand? So I have a fear of God, and this platform, this pulpit is serious take it serious. I know I'll be a little accountable for what I do in here. So if you allow me the honor and the privilege of speaking a little truth today, Amen. and it helps you so be it, if not, then that's okay too. Anyway, John 3, 16. John says, for God so dearly loved the world. Everybody. Jesus loves the little children of the world, don't he? Black and yellow, red and white. Jesus loves all the children of the world. Why? Because we are precious in his sight. For God so loved all of us that he gave up his only begotten son. That whoever or whosoever. That's the word I remember when I was growing up. Whosoever were to believe in Him, trust in Him, rely and depend on Him. Let me know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Nobody gets to heaven except through Him. I don't care what they say out there. Jesus said, I am the truth. Hello, truth. I am the way. I am the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. Jesus said, whoever. John said, God so dearly loved the Son that, that whoever would believe in Him as the, as the way uh, could have eternal life, would not perish. Then it tells us some facts. We're going to look at facts today. Our text today is John 3, 16 through 21. We're going to look at some facts. Not some fantasies, not some perceptions, not opinion. We're going to look at some facts, some truths that come from God's Word. If you don't like it, don't shoot me. I'm just the preacher. I'm just reading out of the Bible. And it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, to reject it, to condemn it, to pass sentence, render a moral verdict, 
but that the world might be saved, find eternal life, be made safe and sound through Him. He who believes, who is trusted in, relying, and depending on Him, your antidote, Jesus as the object of your faith, if you're relying and trusting in whom you believe in Him, you're not judged. Amplified says you will not come up for judgment. This is talking about the great white throne judgment between the sheep and the goats, and this is the first judgment. Not the Bema seed. This is just that. He says. You won't have to come up for that type of, of a judgment. For in him there is no rejection, no condemnation. He's not judged. He doesn't incur damnation. He's not condemned. Doesn't get a sentence, a life sentence. But he who does not believe is not trusting in him as the object, has already been judged. He's already been convicted. He's already been tried. There's already a moral judgment that is being handed down. He's already rejected. He's already condemned. He's already a dead man walking. He's already going to hell, eternal damnation. Sugar coat it, water down, whatever you want. And it says, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Someone says, how can a holy God send someone to hell? How can a God of love, you know, and you know, it's a good question, but it tells you that, he, that somebody doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> you have no idea <laughs> to even ask such a question. You know, God doesn't God doesn't send anybody to hell. You send yourself. He makes it clear, look, I didn't come down here to, to judge you. You say, oh, you know, you're a judge. Now. I didn't come down here. I came to bring life. I came to give an opportunity. I came to make eternal life available to you. Not reject you, not condemn you, not pronounce verbal moral. Word. I came to give you life, give you salvation. Mm -hmm. Second Peter three says, uh, three nine says, God is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but He is patient towards you, not wishing for any of you to perish, to go to hell, to be damned, but to come to true repentance. True repentance. Second, First Timothy two four says, and God desires that all men be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Saving knowledge. So God doesn't send anybody. He makes this fact. He said, I want you to know something. My nature right now is I came to you to give life, not to judge. But if you fail to believe and you refuse to believe, then God doesn't reject you. You reject God. Therefore, the sentence is, you know, that you're under an indictment. You're already under a judgment. Let me tell you, the only unpardonable sin, people say, well, suicide, oh God, well, as far as I'm concerned, nothing you can do cannot be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But a failure to believe. Amen. If you really think about that, what that basically says is, I can forgive every sin, but if you die and you go to hell, then, then I can't forgive that sin because you made that choice. God gives us a free will. That's what you chose to do. You chose that. I can't forgive that because you haven't even asked for forgiveness. I can't, you know, it could be forgiven very easily, but you haven't asked for that forgiveness. You haven't turned. So if you go to hell today, it's because you refuse to believe, because you basically want to go to hell. Then he goes on in John 3.19. And he says, this is the judgment. This is, a judgment is a decision, a verdict, or an indictment that is handed down from a higher court. An indictment means they finally gathered enough information uh, to, to have reached probable cause that you committed a crime, and they put all this together, and now they're getting ready to bring charges against you. Okay. 
How many know there's still time? Still time. I hate to say it in here, but there's people in here right now, right now, that are going to hell. I'm just speaking in the spirit for the best I know. Billy Graham used to say that, I was reading this other article, like 85% of people that claim to be Christians today, they're sitting in churches here on Sunday morning, have not even been truly born yet. They don't really know God as their personal Lord and Savior. So, have you not been judged or, or have you been judged? Do you believe? Where are you at? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. May you find him now. For this is the judgment. This is the basis of the indictment. These are the grounds of this indictment. It says basically right here, the triune, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God that lives in heaven, has looked down on earth. And... He says he sent Jesus not to judge the world, but to save the world. And he gave this opportunity, and men uh, rejected it. The triune activity looked down and said, okay, they've, uh, they've made a decision. Now, how many know sometimes there's a diet that could be out that doesn't fall through because there's changes in responses, okay? It's not quite done did yet. So there's still time. For this is the judgment. That light has come into this world, but men loved darkness rather than the lights because their deeds were corrupt. Their nature, true inward condition of the heart was corrupt. Everyone who hates the light does not come to the light for fear that his deeds have been exposed. So here you have God. First John 1 5 says that God is truth. You want to know who God is? He's truth. What is truth? It's God. Everything goes back to Him. <laughs> it doesn't matter what. He's the creator of the universe. <laughs> and He is truth. This, there's no other. This is where it stops. And he gave us this rule book. But God is truth. He's truth. He's and he's the light. And God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, to bring the light, the truth. God is God, but he loved us so much he wanted us to know the truth that he sent himself. He became a man in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ he imparted that light into his son. The son came and provided that light, and it was available to all people. John 1 9 says that there was the true light. It's not just John the Baptist said there was a, a true light, which coming down out into the world from heaven that enlightens. Gives revelation, understanding, quickens him. It, it's like a light that comes into a man, and all of a sudden he goes boom, and all of a sudden you go, whoa. You know, you're in darkness, and all of a sudden God's light comes and illumines you and convicts you, and all of a sudden everything comes alive, and you go, whoa. Your whole world, I mean, uh, your whole world changed when you finally met Jesus, Amen. when the true light came in. John 8, 12 says, Jesus spoke to me and saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light. So what this says right here is that God brought the light and we have two types of people. God brought the light that was available for everybody. I am the way, the truth, and the light, but... These people made a decision. They made a decision. Okay. God made a decision. Jesus made a decision to make himself available to all mankind, but men chose huh, to live in darkness.
They could have had light. They could have had eternal life. But for whatever reason, they hated the light. They ran from the light or the truth. Because their heart was corrupt. They didn't want to be exposed. They didn't want their inner condition. They didn't want their heart to be exposed. They wanted to live a lie. They, they, rather, they would rather live in darkness, be in their own, be in their own God. So these are people that, that had an opportunity and choice, but they made a decision. They would rather be in darkness because they didn't want to be exposed for who they really were. They didn't want to grow. They didn't want to change. They would rather live in, in darkness. I was thinking about a, a haunted house or a condemned house or something that's been boarded up by the city and barbed wire and nobody's been in there for 10 years. Everything's peaceful. Isn't it? You got hobos living in there and, you know, nobody care, you know, whatever. But the minute the the minute the city gets a complaint or something, somebody goes in there with light, and next thing you know, they bring light into that darkness, and we got cockroaches running everywhere, we got crackheads running everywhere, we got we got all kinds of stuff being turned upside down, and all heck breaks loose. How many know when light comes into darkness, it exposes darkness? Darkness can't overtake light, but light it takes light to overcome darkness. So these people, they, they wanted to live a lie. They wanted to be their own God. They didn't want no accountability. They don't want to be under authority. They don't want to go to Bible preaching churches. They don't want to be around guys like me. Yeah. So it says they deviate, you know, and they go looking for churches that are user friendly. Second Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, the time will come when people will not endure or be able to remain under sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Sound doctrine is true doctrine. God-centered doctrine. Bible preaching doctrine. It's not watered down, it's not user friendly, it's not greasy grace, it's not sloppy agave. Sound doctrine is sound, healthy, whole doctrine. It comes from God. It's not a doctrine of demons. People will not be able to handle that kind of thing. So, uh, the truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will abandon, reject the light, and go looking for churches and accumulate for themselves teachers and preachers in accordance with their own desires. They will turn aside their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths, opinions, and all kinds of philosophies, but they'll deviate from the truth. People don't want to come to a church like this. You know, because we're trying to help people get well. We're helping them look at their inner life. You have to be willing to take ownership. You have to take responsibility. <laughs> you, know, you can't run from it. You can't hide from it. And People go through our whole program, and as soon as they graduate, they run off to, to other churches where there's bigger churches, more bells, more whistles, and they, 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 the very thing that was working for them, they deviate from, and they go back and surround themselves with uh, other things. To me, that's understandable in some ways. I understand that there's some things, but primarily, why would you want to leave something that's working? I offer myself a lot to, uh, to people that... Uh, that I really want to help, and I offer it to them, and I meet with them a couple times, and pretty soon I find out they're not interested in the truth. They don't really want the truth. They just want to be a victim, and they want me to cry the blues with them, and, and I always give them a free consultation or whatever, and I said, but if you really want to do this, then you're going to need to come to church. You're going to need to be accountable. You're going to need to hear the truth from me. You're going to need to do certain things, and most of the time they just deviate and go off, and I, it's, it blows my mind. Sometimes. But these people will, will hate the truth. Jesus said to them, said, look, you know, in the end times, it, uh, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. If they rejected me, they're going to reject you. So don't get all caught up in it. That's, it is what it is. That's the world we live in. People, a lot of people hate me. 
And that's okay. I don't think that I personally hate me. They hate what I stand for when I'm true. I said earlier that God has called me, and I'm saying all this because of these things emerging and developing me. My roles have changed. God is, is calling me to a, a last, I'm in my last lap. I'm in my last journey. I'm in the last quarter, quarter mile. It won't be four. I want to finish my life strong. I want to run a good race. I want to fight the good fight. I want to go to heaven. You, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to go to heaven with a clear conscience. I want to know that I made mistakes, I've blown up, but either way, I've done the best I can, and I'm going to heaven, you know, in a blaze of glory. And God has called me to a new level of preaching God's righteousness, His code, His moral standard, not the world, but His standard. Okay. He's also called me to go to a new level of being a, a political patriot. This is where I run into some people who give me some hard time. Well, you're a preacher, whatever. Well, I'm a preacher of righteousness. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a preacher of righteousness. My job as a prophet now is to step back and watch and pray and see what's really going on. Okay? And right now, our world is, is, is in a spirit of lawlessness, and it's going down fast. I believe he's already given up on the, on the world in some ways, and now he's judging the church. Yeah. Judgment starts with the house of God. Yeah. The world has still got an opportunity, but I believe it's past that. I believe now God is focusing on the church. He wants to know who are the true remnant. Who are the true believers? Who are those that have been truly born again from above? Yeah. And there's an amazing spirit of lawlessness that's trying to undermine that or trying to keep people from knowing the truth and send them to hell. So God has called me to stand up Politically, not not to not to uh, pick a side, but to stand up for what is true. Now, you may not like Trump. You might not do all that. That's up to you. Whatever. I don't necessarily care for one way or the other. But but when I spent time in prayer and I weigh it out, not looking at Democrat or, or people, when I look at what the Spirit is saying, okay, and I look at the agendas, okay, that that's what you got to look at. What are what are the truths? What are the realities? What what, what is what is going on? One of them is, let me just tell you this. One of them is the spirit of lawlessness. And one of them is the spirit of righteousness. Okay? I ain't saying they're all perfect. They're, it's kind of twisted and, and done all that. But either way in that, I believe God has called me to, to stand up for, for Trump because I believe he is the last days King Cyrus type person that is an instrument of righteousness. He's not perfect and do all that. But I believe his platform and what he means is, and, and people get it, people hate me for that. Talking to some girl there, and she, you know, I would say, well, you know, I just got to talk about does she support Trump or whatever. You know, that tells me a lot. You know, just what, what, what your perception is. Because yeah, but I don't post it on Facebook, and I don't do all that. And I'm like, well, you know, I understand all that, but but on another level, why not? You know, I don't have to use the word truth, Trump, but are you standing up for righteousness? This is the thing. There, there's a. There's a spirit going on, and we Christians need to stand up. We need we don't have a dark problem. We got a light problem. Dark is dark. It's always we need to get some light out into the darkness. God has called me to stand up and be a preacher of righteousness and say the truth. And so help me God, I could be wrong, and I gotta be careful. I'm not saying be stupid and just run your mouth and your opinion. No, I'm talking about in the spirit. In the spirit, join what God is saying and speak the truth. Not your flesh, not what you think, but speak the truth. Yeah. I believe that's a whole other thing. Amen. So, these people have ran from the light, but listen to this, what Romans says. Romans says at 118, it says the wrath of God. I wouldn't need to go preach that in a Hyper Grace Church with a sloppy agape. This wouldn't fly right there. No, I'm just reading the Bible here. It says the wrath of God. That means his anger. How many know God gets anger? How many know he's emo? God's frustration, his emotion, his attitude, his impulse and feelings is revealed or it's being revealed. It's being revealed. This moral indictment, this judgment is being revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of those who suppress the truth. Truth suppressors. 
For since the, because that which is known about God is evident within them, God wired it in them the truth. There's no such thing as an atheist. God put himself in mankind, and it's evident to them. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood, what has been made, so they were without excuse. Walk before the judge. Oh, judge. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. It's over. Case closed. No rebuttal. It's a done dead deal. What is that thing? For since the creation of the world, so they are without excuse. So for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who has blessed them forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to a degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural functions of women, and we went on and on and on. And basically, that's a reprobate mind. That's a mind that God gave opportunity to, He gave truth to, He came gave revelation. He lived inside of them. He gave them ample time, but, but they, re, they rejected the truth. They would rather walk in darkness than light. Therefore, God says he takes his hand off of them, not necessarily sending them to hell, but a reprobate mind means a mind that has been re abandoned, rejected. It means I love you, I came for you, but I've been patient, I've been kind. I've done everything I can do, and you reject me. <coughs> Therefore, there's a moral indictment that is being sent down, and you're already under judgment. John 3.21 then goes on to say, Now I'll get to my sermon. <laughs> Anybody hear anything today? Yeah. All right, we're not too far. All right, so. But he who practices the truth comes to the light. He runs to the light. So that his deeds may be manifested and exposed to everybody, indicating that he is born again and God is working in him. God is exposing him. God is bringing things out. In other words, he's been enlightened, he's been changed, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, now he wants to change, and now he wants more and more and more. So now, where he was out here being his own God, running from the light, being his own thing, now it's changed. And now instead of running from the light, now he runs into the light. So that his true inner heart condition may be revealed. He wants to get well. He embraces the truth. He likes being spoke to. He doesn't like the way it feels, but he's teachable. He wants accountability. He wants to be around good, godly preaching. He wants to, to be around uh, uh, authority. He doesn't want to be his own God. We've got this thing called a sociogram sometimes. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of them? Uh, In Duncan. Everybody feared the stool, they called it. Feared the stool. Stool is when all the 70 men in the program get together and everybody votes each other. Good things, bad things, the things they see, they pray over it, they spend time with it. They all get together and they speak this truth in front of you. They do all these tallies and then they pick out, after these votes, who are the positives and who are the negatives. Who are the ones that are working their program and who are the ones that aren't. It's the way to make the church healthy. Okay, we want to be healthy, so we're going to expose and not to boot anybody out, not to judge anybody about, but hopefully they'll see the error of their ways, take ownership of it, and repent. There was a guy here one time, that, he was actually a pastor here one time, and he had like a, the lowest, like an 0 and 70 one time. <laughs> and the fear is that when they tell them, they always pick out and they give them a stool. They call it getting stooled. Worst thing everybody fears being on the stool. Can you imagine putting yourself out in front of everybody? What do you think of me? People terrified that. It used to terrify me, but I started thinking later on in life, if I really want to get well, why am I, why was I at Dumpton? Why was I there? Why would you know, if I was all that, why would I be there? People were voting me on being self-righteous and religious and hypocrite. And I said, religious, oh that's good. 
Self-righteous, that's good. <laughs> but I was hiding. I didn't want to buy to find out who I really, really was. Yeah. God said to me, so why are you here? And I said, and the answer, no, you know, I said, if you really were here for the right reasons, you would want to get well. You would listen to what they're saying, embrace what they're saying. Instead of running from the stool, you would run to the stool. <laughs> you, you'd tie it to your butt and live, live a life on the stool. Are you with me? Yeah. So, these are people that want to get well. There's a scripture in... Uh, it's not up there. I think it's Psalms 36.4. 36.9. It says, In his light, we see light. Very short, but powerful. In the devil's darkness, I don't have any light. I don't have any truth. I can be my own God. I can be an island unto myself. I can be a fantasy. I can do whatever I want. I'll never get well, you know. Yeah. But it says, but people that people that live here, it says they're God's wrath. <laughs> okay, they don't realize they're, they they think they're by themselves and it's going to be a good. No, it says they're under the wrath of God. It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness for men who suppress the truth. That means God's attitude and wrath, condemnation, and judgment under these type of people. They're not getting away with it. And they're being turned over to reprobate minds. People who suppress the truth. But in the light, when we live in the light, the word practice, the light means habit, discipline, um, how we walk. <coughs> I can walk over here, I can walk over here, I can walk in light, I can walk in darkness, I can walk anywhere I want to walk. Okay? It's my conduct, it's my behavior, it's my environment that I choose to live in. I can live in this environment, or I live in this environment. I tried this environment. Finally, I said running wasn't the way to do it, so I decided I wanted to come to the light. And in his light, I can see light. There's a light. Truth. And if I really want to get well, it may be painful. It might not be fun. John says, uh, and you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. How I many you know the truth sometimes is painful? Getting to freedom. Somewhere the pain has got to become more painful to stay here than it is going through the fire in the light. But in his light, if I really want, I'll run to the light. I'll get in his presence. I'll pray. I'll read my word. I'll uh, do a daily moral inventory. I'll let God examine me so that I can find out the true inner condition. So let me ask you today, where are you walking? Are you walking in darkness, rebellion? Under God's wrath, headed to hell? Well, maybe. Repent. Get back. Repent. Get in, the, get in the light. Quit being your own God. Quit running from God. There's guys here in the program. You're just doing time. I'm here. Go home if you're not. You know I'm saying if you're not serious about this. I've been there. I'm with you guys. I had a three and seven gram one time that changed my life. He started calling me spiritually lazy and doing all this thing, and I was so mad and so angry. I finally went to God and said, God said, why don't you start to shut up? Why don't you start listening to some people? If you were all that, why are you here after 38 years ago? Why don't you shut your mouth and start listening? That's the way God talks to me sometimes. And I said, oh, great idea. <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong. And, uh, so I finally had to make a decision. So, you know, where, where are you at in this? You know, I'm just preaching a message. Today, David prayed in Psalms 139. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if they're being hurtful way to way in. That's David saying, Lord, I'm a mess. I've made all kinds of sins. I don't trust my own judgment, Lord, but I'm asking you to give you permission for you to come with your light and search me to searching and fearless my heart inventory. Eliminate what's bad. Let me see what's good. Uh, let me get it on paper. Let me take it to you and then lead me in the everlasting way. I call that the seatbelt prayer. I prayed one day, oh, search me, oh God, no my I'm trying to make some stuff. Examine me and lead me in the everlasting. I come out and the next thing I know something happened, boy, I'm in the flesh, I'm reacting, I'm, you know, I'm like, what in the world? The Lord said, will you? You prayed for me to search your heart and to reveal your character defects. 
I'm just doing what you told me to do. Don't shoot me. So this is a great prayer. Be careful. Don't, if you're going to pray, you better put on a seatbelt and get ready for a ride. Okay? But the question is, how bad do you want to get well? One last verse. First John says, uh, 5 through 7. This is the message. God is light in him. There is no darkness whatsoever. So if we say that we are partakers together and enjoy fellowship with him, we get we live and practice and walk in darkness, then we are lying. We don't really practice the truth, living and walking in light. But if you really are living in the light, you're walking in the light, as he is in the light, then you have true unbroken fellowship with him, and the blood of Jesus Christ will forgive you for all sins. So let's bow our heads today. And we're going to pray a song. I don't know. I'd say the altar's open up here. We ain't got really an altar, but you can kneel down wherever you're at. It doesn't take that. This is the time to forget about everybody else and ask yourself, where am I in my spiritual journey? Amen? Amen. Well, amen. Let's all stand. I hope you've had a good time today. Let's be careful out there. Love you. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm going to lift your hand. Lord, I just reach up to you to call down favor and blessings on us today. Leave, Lord, may all we put our hands to prosper. Let your light shine on us. Give us peace and joy. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 See you. See you. See you.